Already the three libraries of President Roosevelt, President Truman, and President Eisenhower, by their unique documentation, are today, uh, they serve this purpose. And today we now dedicate the fourth, my own. unique from other presidents, largely because of his humanitarian efforts, both before and after the presidency. He essentially fed over 800 million people from the period of 1914 to his death in October of 1964. And he did it largely based upon his own fortune. Uh, he was a multimillionaire by 1914 that he earned as a mining engineer. Uh, and he made a conscious decision in 1914 that he would live off that fortune and use it in his service uh, in humanitarian efforts, but also in public service. He didn't take a salary when he served in Woodrow Wilson's cabinet as food administrator. He didn't take it from Presidents Harding and Coolidge when he served as Secretary of Commerce. And he was the first president not to take a salary as president. Herbert Hoover ran for president. 1928, and he took over in January of 1929, and almost immediately he had to deal with the Great Depression. And that was going to form his presidency um, situation where, because of some of his strengths, as far as letting people work problems out for themselves, uh, government volunteerism, people doing different things to help out the government, um, he took kind of a pass. His decisions were to try to work things out with having, without having governmental relief. And that ended up being his downfall. And we know that because the six, seven, eight years after it, you know, not only the war came into effect, but Congress had to work with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt so that they could uh, you know, come up with some governmental programs. And that's what got us out of that depression. The trajectory of Hoover from being born in West Branch to becoming president wasn't a straight line. Um, Hoover's childhood was very tragic. His father died when he was six. His mother died when he was nine. He had an older brother and younger sister. So uh, an uncle who lived in Iowa tried to take them in and keep them as a family unit but couldn't, he couldn't uh, support them as well as his own family. So at the age of 10, Herbert Hoover was sent to live with an aunt and uncle in Oregon who had just lost a son of their own. So Hoover was kind of replacement labor. He attended Stanford University. Stanford University was created as a living memorial for Stanford, Leland Stanford's son. To get people to go, he offered free tuition and fees for that founding class. So Hoover signed up as a, in a geology major, became a mining engineer, um, but when he graduated, he couldn't get a job. He was pushing an ore cart in a California mine, 10 hour days, $2 a day. He then got a job as a typist at an engineering firm in San Francisco they were so impressed by him that they recommended him for a job in Western Australia in the gold fields. Uh, Bewick Mooring was the largest mining company in the world at that time, located out of London. They wanted someone in their 30s with 10 years of experience. Hoover was in his early 20s with kind of zero experience. But he went, he was able to take mines that were marginal profitability, make them profitable. But he also discovered the richest vein of gold in the history of Australia. He also contributed 
large amounts of money um, and more than double the number of boys clubs uh, from the period of 1936 to his death in 64. His wife, Lou Henry Hoover, was involved with the Girl Scouts. And when she took over, she more than doubled the membership, uh, putting it over a, a million. They were very much interested in um, things that helped children. They thought children were the future. And the way you treat them uh, as children would uh, be reflected in the way they acted as adults. Safe places. Uh, and as well as mentors, um, you know, the, these were things that the Hoovers really cared about. Some of his strengths on why he was elected, he was a good businessman. He had been Secretary of Commerce under Harding. His reputation was very good, but he made the wrong decision on how to deal with the Depression almost immediately. And he didn't get any advice from Congress at the time, so he's the guy that gets the blame for it. He was very much into volunteerism, helping people out. He was into aviation. Um, he knew the importance of radio, and he was able to get some things going, uh, not for just politicians, but for consumers and for the public. I think that Hoover foresaw all of that, but because once again, of the Great Depression and the time that he spent dealing with that, a lot of his strengths, volunteerism, a lot of things he did during World War One and after World War One and during, you know, later on World War Two, we were not able to see any of that because there wasn't time for it. Who was greatest impact on this country are, are things he did as Commerce Secretary. Standardization. He was able to sit get industries to sit down and set industrial standards. So there were 42 different sizes of milk containers. Hoover got the dairy industry to sit down and create pint, quart, half gallon, gallon. It's still with us today. The size brick that's used in your home or in buildings is a size set when Hoover was Secretary of Commerce. And it was that when you create industrial standards, it lowers the costs and it provides uh, con a consumer ben benefit. The other thing Hoover did uh, as Commerce Secretary was the Colorado River uh, Agreement. It essentially created what we now call the Hoover Dam. It helped regulate floodwaters that impacted seven different states and created very cheap hydroelectric power again for those seven states. It's considered one of the modern marvels of the world. These are things that are still with us today, uh, though we've probably long forgotten that it was Herbert Hoover that gave them to us.